Hello, and wherever you are in the world, welcome to this webinar. We're pleased that you're joining us for today's session. And before we hand over to our panelists, we'll run through a few housekeeping details. Firstly, there's a member of IOSH team operating behind the scenes to ensure the smooth running of this webinar. They are available to help you should you need it, and you can message them using the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. You will also see a Q&A option. If you have any questions relating to the content, please post these here. A Q&A will be carried out towards the end of the session and we'll get through as many questions as we can. At the end of the presentation, a feedback poll will appear on your screen. Please take a moment to complete this as we value your feedback and this helps us to improve our service to you and shape future guidance. Any value you gain from this session can be used as part of your CPD portfolio. We do not issue formal certificates of attendance for our webinars, but you will receive an email confirming your attendance, details of which can be used to record your CPD. Information on CPD can be found on our website. Where we have been given a speaker's consent, these webinars are recorded and will be made available on our website. You'll also be able to find a list of all our other recordings, as well as details of any upcoming webinars. Finally, details of all of this information will also be posted in the chat box shortly. We would now like to hand over to our panellists and hope that you, as listeners, enjoy the session. Thank you. Uh, well, hello everybody, and wherever you are in the world right now, thank you for joining us. I'm Neil Catton, Vice President of IOSH, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our series of COVID-19 webinars. As you know, IOSH, the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, is the chartered body and the world's largest membership organisation for health and safety professionals, with over 47,000 members in 130 countries working in nearly every sector. Our vision is a safer, healthier world of work for everyone. Today's session is the second of 2021 as we continue our COVID-19 webinar series. And we are delighted today to bring this webinar to you in association with the Law Society. The pandemic continues to have a major impact on workplaces across most industries worldwide. With the arrival of new variants of the COVID-19 virus having an even greater impact on our livelihoods, new health and wellbeing provisions and responses are needed to enable the world to continue functioning and to recover. Today's webinar will focus on the law in lockdown. It will address how the law has evolved during lockdown and how the legal profession has adapted. This session will run through a number of preset questions so this time, we will not be able to take questions from the audience. However, if you do have a burning question for the panel, please do add it in the Q&A panel and we shall see if we can get this answered for you offline. So before we begin our discussion, I'd like to welcome our esteemed panellists joining us today. Each one has an impressive level of expertise. May I first introduce Stephanie Boyce, Vice President of the Law Society Stephanie has a wealth of experience in corporate governance, regulatory frameworks and professional regulation. A council member of the Law Society of England and Wales, representing the Women, Women Lawyers Division. She is also past honorary secretary of the City of Westminster and Holborn Law Society, a solicitor member of the Joint Tribunal Service, a former member of the Law Society's Council Membership Committee, a former member of the Law Society's Regulatory Affairs Board, an ex officio committee member of the Women's Lawyers Division, and former chair of the Conduct Committee. Welcome, Stephanie. 
Next, we have Matthew Brakel, Partner and Head of Health and Safety Commercial Solutions at law firm DAC Beechcroft. Matthew has joined us for a number of Irish webinars, providing regular legal updates to our members. He advises on corporate criminal investigations and defending prosecutions brought by regulatory agencies such as the Health and Safety Executive, local authorities, the Environment Agency, police, fire authorities, the Office for Rail and Roads and the key CQC. Matthew is a member of IOSH and a committee member for the Humber branch and the IOSH Consultancy Group. He also sits on the advisory group for the HQN Safety Network. It's great to have you with us again, Matthew. Finally, can I ask Colleen Thoreen, please, to join us on screen? Colleen is a tri-qualified solicitor with over 25 years legal and commercial experience, working with businesses and NGOs across sectors at both strategic and operational level. She is the founder and CEO of Ardia International, a specialist sustainability, business and human rights consultancy with expertise in modern slavery. She is a fellow IEMA and, a, and an honorary fellow of the Peter Centre for Research on Slavery, Exploitation and Abuse and an associate le lecturer in the Law School at Birkbeck. Colleen is also a member of the BSI Committee developing a guidance standard for organisations on modern slavery. Colleen sits on the disciplinary board for APSCA and the Environment Board for Lexus PLC. She widely published, her vision is to harness her niche legal expertise to help companies understand how to meet their legal obligations on sustainability, business and human rights, and how to create progressive voluntary best practice standards. So that's our panel and welcome to the panel and thank you for joining us today. Let's start by looking at COVID and the workplace. I would like to invite Stephanie, if I may, to start by giving us an insight into what impacts she has seen COVID have on the legal profession in general. Stephanie, could you spend just a few minutes, please, describing some of the main effects the pandemic is having for your members? Thank you very much, uh, Neil, for the introduction. And can I say, it is a pleasure to be here amongst such esteemed guests, even if it is a shame that we are unable to meet uh, face to face. Hopefully everyone can hear me. The social and economic impact of the pandemic and the UK's withdrawal from the, e the European Union and many years of severe underfunding in the justice system means that the demand for legal advice is high. Whilst access to justice and the rule of law are threatened in part owing to the extremely challenging operating environment uh, uh, facing many providers of legal services. And our members are operating an, in an uncertain market environment and some of the main effects of the, uh, the pandemic is having for our members are the increasing importance and value of technology in the legal sector and access to justice to highlight two areas in particular that I will concentrate on. We've already seen how the use of technology has played out in our daily lives over the past 10 months. Today I'm addressing you virtually rather than in person and I'm sure most of you conduct your daily work much in the same way currently. That, that this is not the considered uh, uh, slightest bit unusual um, at this time is a sign of how far uh, the norm has shifted in the past year. Remote working, video conferencing and the mute button are not merely temporary fixes to the challenges posed by the pandemic. They are part of the future of legal services and will continue to feature prominently in lawyers' work in the years to come. Turning to the justice system, Safety must be the priority as we strive to keep the wheels of justice turning. Given the substantial backlog of cases in the criminal courts and the civil courts, which has greatly been exacerbated by the pandemic, it is vital to ensure as far as uh, safely uh, as possible that the process of justice continues. And justice is already being delayed for victims, witnesses, defendants, um, who have proceedings perhaps hanging over them for months, a loss of liberty, if not years, with cases now being listed for 2022 and 2023. The safety of all court users is paramount, especially given the new, more easily transmissible uh, coronavirus variant. And we welcome the steps uh, the government has taken to make the courts as safe as possible. But it is essential that these meet the added risk of the new variant and that there is effective enforcement 
to ensure that individual courts are applying the measures effectively. Risk assessments must be up to date and readily available to all those expected to attend court and safety measures including social distancing and the wearing of face coverings should be strictly enforced. And we strongly endorse the Lord Chief Justice's position that no participant in legal proceedings should be required by a judge or magistrate to attend court unless it is necessary or in the interest of justice. And all those who play their part in keeping the wheels of justice turning, including our members, many of whom are in an aging demographic, must be provided with a safe working environment as possible. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you very much. Uh, now let me ask Matthew to give us a picture, Matthew, if you could please, of how the legal profession has been impacted by COVID from your perspective. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Neil, and um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's great to be working with um, IOSH on a regular basis at the moment and supporting the great work that IOSH are doing across the, uh, the globe and supporting uh, health and safety. Um, it's a really interesting question. From my perspective, at the very beginning of March of last year, I was due to start a four-week trial in Liverpool Crown Court, and I recall uh, discussions the night before of uh, all the barristers involved in the case and all the lawyers involved in the case, and we were talking about whether we actually thought we were going to be getting on as, at that point, um, COVID was um, still being um, discussed. There was still no lockdown in place, and life as we knew it was um, singing happy birthday or washing your hands, not uh, being stuck at home. And uh, it was really interesting because we all marched into court on the Monday morning um, and in about half an hour's time after that, we all marched out um, and uh, the, the case had been uh, completely abandoned at that point. And fears about a lockdown coming, fears about the jury not being safe, fears about the barristers, the lawyers not being safe, the witnesses not being safe, all of those featured. Um, and indeed, here we are, um, you know, nearly a year on and that case is not theoretically listed till June and I would be surprised um, if it took place in June. So yes, I think the legal profession has been massively impacted, not just from a criminal or civil um, or courts perspective, um, which uh, Stephanie's indicated has had a massive impact across the whole profession, but interestingly as, as law firms, uh, especially like a, a firm like ours, which is a global law firm, the fact that we've had to support colleagues across the world facing different sorts of regimes in terms of what their lockdown measures are, if they've got them, um, and support our colleagues across the whole of the, uh, the globe. And I think what has been amazing in terms of the impact on the legal profession is the resilience that certainly all our lawyers have shown, and frankly, that I think everyone has shown across the world in adapting as best as they can in incredibly difficult circumstances. And I think it has been absolutely uh, heartwarming. There's so many um, heartwarming stories out there, but I think that resilience has also been uh, combined with a healthy amount of humour within the legal profession and indeed uh, no perhaps um, quite so recent as the uh, lawyer that unfortunately ended up with a cat filter on his face on a Zoom hearing and rather than make a mission out of it just cracked on with the hearing and I think what we've seen is people having to be a lot more patient um, and people having a lot more flexibility in what they expect people to do and the legal profession has continued from uh, my perspective the people I'm speaking with in the profession has continued to deliver a very high quality level of advice, very high quality level of service. And actually there's been a lot more understanding that what the new norm is at the moment is completely different. But I think the, the way the profession has adapted has been incredible really. And, uh, and my hat goes off to absolutely everyone um, who, who's making the justice system across the world work in these circumstances. So from my point of view, I, I think it just is a, a beacon of hope rather than anything else that We've seen people adapt so quickly and perform so well in, in these challenging times. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed for that, Matt. And uh, Colleen, how has the pandemic affected your chief areas of interest and expertise? And what changes have you seen both in principle and in practice, if you could please? Thank you, Neil. Thanks for inviting me. I'm just delighted to be here today. We're talking along 
um, Stephanie and Matthew and, and listening particularly to both of their insights um, around both the legal profession and um, the broader, more challenging areas around access to justice. Um, from my perspective, we um, have a specialist uh, consultancy uh, working on business and human rights, sustainability and modern slavery. And the work that we do is to support organizations in ensuring that their policies and their due diligence processes are sufficient and, and are able to address the kind of things that we've seen arising in the pandemic. And I think, um, you know, what, I, what I've seen over the last year, as I suppose many people um, who are listening and part of this webinar have probably witnessed this themselves, is the, the impact to business on one level. So um, ensuring that uh, the mental health of the employees is protected, um, having to put in place all kinds of different options for people to be able to work comfortably, to be able to carry out if they are in the legal profession, the kind of work that they do. But I think um, from, from our perspective, working particularly around um, supply chain issues, what we've obviously seen has been this um, tremendous impact on the supply chain and, and vulnerable people. And, you know, when we're talking about um, the impact of law and the pandemic, um, and particularly with these vulnerable people, I think that, you know, there's a need perhaps to, to step back and to see, you know, what, what is happening and how are companies managing this through their processes and their policies. And we've seen, you know, companies um, that have stopped uh, sourcing in some areas. In other areas, we've seen companies um, wanting to, um, to increase the demand of what is needed. And of course, all of this is testing the way that a company acts. Um, you know, what policies did they have in place in the first place? Um, did they have procedures that could actually manage this kind of crises where there's the need for greater PPE? There might be agreed for different kind of protections that need to be put in place for vulnerable people. And, and I think what, what has really struck me is that those companies that um, have as a culture, a mindset as well of wanting to do the right thing, of wanting to ensure that they're resilient. They've stepped up and they've, they've tested their policies, they're looking at their procedures and they're really trying to ensure that they are addressing these issues from you know sourcing of raw materials upwards. The other companies, the other kind of mindset that we're seeing is businesses that perhaps are just driven by a compliance approach and um, and not necessarily looking to do um, the right thing. And I think that there's going to be a test around that in terms of resilience. And because we're seeing um, stepping back as a, sort of from a principal approach that investors are now also more interested in this. So I know this is a slightly left wing to what Stephanie and Matthew are bringing to this conversation, but I think that, you know, hopefully an insight of, you know, the law and how it's also impacting um, law firms as businesses with their own supply chains, that that, um, that insight might be helpful in the conversation that we're having today. Lovely, Colleen, uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you all for those, those opening uh, segments. They're very, very helpful to set the scene. So what we're going to do now is to move to some preset questions, which I'd like to put to our panel members, if I may, please. Uh, so I'm going to start first with Matthew. What steps, Matthew, is an employer required to make when it comes to making the workplace as safe and COVID secure as possible? Well, thank you, Neil. I mean, um, I think uh, in terms of uh, England and Wales, which is where I, I can practice as a solicitor um, and uh, some of the guidance coming out within the UK, uh, ultimately, um, in reality, the position in terms of health and safety hasn't changed. It's risk assesses and look at your risk assessment um, look at what measures you can take to mitigate the risk of transmission um, and um, how you can protect your workforce and then implement your risk assessments and you know make sure your risk assessment involves your workforce where appropriate. And the HSE uh, have published uh, huge amounts of guidance um, and I think uh, what we've seen has been an evolving picture as the year has progressed, as 2020 went on. Um, I recall that we were being asked frequently to provide advice to clients around how to make the workplace secure, what the requirements were, what the guidance was. 
Um, and, and I recall at one point doing some work in the um, social care sector where we were preparing a note and by the time we'd almost got it ready to go, the guidance had changed and it was changing on nearly a, a half daily basis around the requirements for PPE within the, within the care sector. And that proved really quite challenging in the end to try and make sure that the advice that we were getting out was was current and that would last sufficiently long enough for the organisations and clients to implement those changes. And I think uh, what we have seen in terms of um, the advice that we've been providing and uh, our clients coming to us is very much a sector led approach. So yes, the employer needs to make the workplace secure if they're going to open up for business. Clearly current government guidance is stay at home if you can, um, only go into work if you have to. But actually, um, some simple measures that um, organisations have taken have been incredible. I mean, I, I think back to our firm and, uh, for example, when uh, we were able to go back into the office, um, our employees were instructed that only go in if you really have to or if you really need to, if there's a business need. Um, and uh, we introduced a, a, um, uh, an app for desk booking. Um, so you could do it um, before you went into the office so that there was, we could do our own track and trace. Um, I've never seen quite so much hand sanitizer in my life as mm -hmm. uh, on our floor. Um, and um, there was a real desire to make sure that not only did the place, our office, be risk assessed and be safe, but actually people felt safe within that environment. And I think that's probably been one of the slight disconnects here where work safe is workplaces have been technically safe in terms of the measures the employers have taken. But I think what we have seen is the workforce not necessarily feeling safe or feeling that they've um, been there. And I think that's caused a lot of employers, a lot of issues. And I know my colleagues in our employment team have frequently asked questions about um, employees that are meant to be shielding. Can they come into the workplace if they want to? Do they have to stay at home? Um, issues around um, working from a home, DSE assessments, um, but in terms of the actual going into work, I think the sector approach has been quite interesting. And I just thought it'd be useful to touch on a couple. Um, you know, the um, care sector has adapted amazingly well. Um, and um, when you think about the huge amounts of PPE that were required to provide personal care to uh, support people, even then to where people are supporting people within their homes and then having to, um, self-isolate with these people if they tested positive for COVID, the sacrifices that a lot of people in that sector have made. And there was a huge amount of guidance that was being provided and changing regularly. And I think what we've got to now in terms of that sector is a, a bit more stability and the ability for people to understand what the rules are. And I think the rules have crystallised um, a little bit as well. Um, in terms of transport, I was speaking with a colleague of mine from our um, criminal motor defence team, Charlotte Le Maire, and um, she was saying that, you know, vehicles have been operating, fleets have been operating, um, and the uh, guidance that employees, um, the steps that some employees have had to put in place, things like trying to reorganise the movement of fleet vehicles, trying to make sure people are married up with vehicles or cleaning regimes are in place, and then making sure that employees know how to clean a vehicle, that there's sufficient materials there for to clean and I think construction finally has, has been allowed to operate pretty much throughout all of this and if you think about it construction is one of those sectors where a lot of individuals work together to build or demolish whatever the construction project is um, and I think the fact that the, the steps they've had to take in place um, stuff that we take for granted as safety practitioners, like team meetings, briefings on risk assessments, briefing on method statements, the construction industry has really had to adapt and be seen to be safe. And I think that comes back to uh, the point I made at the beginning, really, that, um, you know, risk assessing is the step forward, is the way forward to determine for your business and for your workforce what you need to do and the people within your workforce. But actually, I think a lot of the issues are not necessarily coming from that, that process, but really what the outcome is and the workforce maybe not feeling that they're getting the benefit of that. Uh, Matthew, thank you very much indeed for that great answer. I just wonder if uh, the other panel members may want to add to this, perhaps some areas of concern where you feel workers haven't been uh, protected protected well from the virus perhaps anything to add on that question anybody 
anything I would add, Neil, I mean, absolutely, I think Matthew covered most of it, uh, um, if not all of it. Um, but what I would add is it has to be a two-way conversation, you know, in, in talking with staff, individual staff, um, and assessing, you know, what uh, uh, what the issues might be, you know, uh, uh, how they can be met, best met. Um, but it's a it's a two-way conversation that has to be had. Um, and then you take it from there. Um, so I think that's absolutely important that, that you know, all voices are heard um, and reasonable adjustments are made uh, uh, for individuals. Um, uh, uh, and that is taken into consideration uh, when looking at, uh, uh, you know, who's required in the office if they cannot work from home um, and the measures that must be put in place uh, if individuals are coming into the office, but not just into the office as well, because we have to think about uh, uh, also in our homes, our homes have become, uh, uh, or, or somebody said, you know, we now live at work. Uh, um, so it's also about those conversations, the equipment at, in our homes um, uh, uh, and, and having that conversation with employers and employees as to how uh, needs can be met in a safe way. Thank you. Anything else to add, Colleen, on that one? No, I mean, it's so interesting, um, Matthew and Stephanie, um, you know, talking about um, how the conversations have to evolve, but also the risk assessments. And I think um, from a completely different perspective, I think there's also the, the additional burden for businesses, and I'm thinking particularly around the construction sector, of um, having to take into account um, potential exploitation of workers um, where, you know, we are in a, in a place now where um, work and jobs are at risk. So it is more obvious that um, people are going to be seeking employment and particularly in the informal industry, which I'll talk about it, uh, in another question. And so I think when they risk assessing, there is also that need of having a different lens to understand as well that they are potentially there could be more exploitation taking place within your workforce or with your agency workers and and just to be sensitive to that and to be open to understand what the indicators might be of somebody that is stressed or you know potentially exploited you know in in sort of forced labor or modern slavery conditions sure thank you very much panelists for that so I'm actually going to return to the subject of working at home now to expand a little bit more. Stephanie, if I can come to you, uh, many of us are now working from home and it's supposed to be safer, but how would you define an employer's duty of care to an employee working at home specifically? What is the law society stance on this? Well, I think the starting point is, you know, unless a worker has signed uh, a, a waiver, they're not allowed to work more than 48 hours a week. Um, and I think, you know, we have to be very clear on that and, and, and going back to what I said earlier about we now live at work. Um, and, and we know that individuals, especially women, um, the burden of childcare, uh, homeschooling and so forth have fallen disproportionately on uh, uh, females. Um, and so employers have to be alive to that. Um, is that, um, and also uh, uh, if an employer has found to have created a hostile environment, which has pushed a worker over the edge, and that person resigns, they may be able to bring uh, a, an, um, an unfair dismissal claim in the employment tribunal. Um, and these things are always case specific to the worker, but uh, uh, so the workers should seek um, advice from an employment lawyer uh, before making such a claim. Um, and this is one of the things uh, 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 where it's a lot better for workers and managers to be able to have open conversations, uh, much of what I spoke about earlier, and come to reasonable agreements it, it certainly doesn't benefit anyone for an employee to be constantly stressed. Um, so it's important, as I say, to have those conversations, what adjustments can be made, um, and just to be, and to communicate and alive to that at all times. Holy Stephanie, thank you very much indeed for that answer. Colleen, I'm going to turn to you now uh, with a new question. What would you say has been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on employees in supply chains including international supply chains. What about those that are more vulnerable to exploitation and what's their position? What are their rights? Thank you, Neil. Um, just again, to pick up on something that um, Stephanie said as part of my response to you, Neil, um, I think 
that emphasis on how many um, women have been inadvertently affected by the pandemic is a very real one as well when we think about the supply chains. I mean, the, the ILO has recently brought out a report on informal work and it's estimating that there's about 2 billion people worldwide. So that's 61% of the world's em employed population are caught up in the informal sector. And the reason I highlight that is because when we're talking about um, supply chains and vulnerability, if you are in an informal sector, by and large, um, as a woman, you will be particularly affected by the pandemic. You will be affected because there is often a lack of representation in trade unions. There's no employment contracts. There's no protection around your employee status. And I think what we've seen with the pandemic has been a real highlighting of the issues around informal employment and the potential and growth around exploitation. So this this sort of hidden workforce that sits behind so many of the things that we source face dangerous and unsafe working conditions. They have increased um, vulnerability around poverty and discrimination. And unfortunately, they have very, very little or no rights. And so we've seen, um, you know, um, uh, strikes and taking place because of lack of trade union representation in Bangladesh and and actually what has been a reprisal to that is simply just um, making people you know redundant and, and not really protecting them so the pandemic has had an enormously negative impact um, for the most vulnerable people and and actually I, I think something that um, perhaps people don't think about but it goes to Matthew's point about hand sanitizer but ethanol which is the main ingredient comes from burning cane from sugarcane resourcing and when you look at the occupational health and safety issues around sourcing of sugar cane and um, the workers who are involved in those supply chains prone to machete injuries and respir respir respiratory problems from burning cane. We don't see that in the media. We don't see, you know, what sits, as I said, behi behind so much of, of what um, we actually source on. So unfortunately, you know, it's a bit of a bleak picture. Um, just to bring it home for those people who are listening to this thinking, well, that's, you know, art and supply chain is not part of the UK. The scandal around Boohoo is a very real reminder as well that these issues are pertinent to the UK and it's pertinent to, to any business that um, they really look to their employees in their supply chains and look at what is being put in place to protect them by way of employment contracts by way of freedom of association by way of access to grievance mechanisms i'll stop there no oh, colleen that's great there's some really interesting food for thought there they think about ethanol and hand sanitizer you just don't necessarily think this but there's a knock-on effect there stephanie or matthew anything to add at all on those ones um stephanie maybe first anything to add the only thing I would add, picking up on the point about hand sanitizer, is also that um, the, some of the ingredients contained in hand sanitizers individuals are allergic to. Um, so, you know, those are all things that, that we have to think about and, and, and build into um, any policies uh, uh, that we may, uh, that may be implemented uh, to make, in making the workplace safe. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think for interest of time, we'll move on to our next question, which also comes to you, Stephanie. Uh, what changes have you seen that have been substantial in changing the way your members work? I think the biggest, as I said earlier when I was speaking, is around uh, technology. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the COVID pandemic perhaps has done in less than 48 hours what may have taken the legal profession 10 years to do. Um, and that is really embrace uh, technology um, uh, uh, and not just in this country, but, you know, around the world. And, and, and Colleen was sharing with me uh, uh, earlier about remote hearings. Um, and certainly I know of one instance where uh, a full remote trial has taken place in the United States. Um, but certainly it's, it's, it's technology. It's changed the way we worked. Um, uh, uh, but 
with technology um, and working from home has come other challenges, uh, the digital divide, you know, individuals who perhaps um, do not have the skills or did not have the skills in order to be uh, digitally savvy or the, you know, the infrastructure, the laptops, computers, um, broadband, I myself have struggled uh, uh, struggled with uh, broadband um, and I'm having to, to, to be very creative and, and pray that this network continues to be stable um, but it's not always been that um, but then you know it's it's the individuals just turn into the other side of uh, uh, the profession in as much as our clients um, the affordability as I say the digital divide uh, uh, where individuals and we've heard stories about individuals who've been trying to attend hearings off of their mobile phone, um, that they haven't had enough data. Um, and, you know, amazing that some of the uh, uh, data providers, uh, uh, mobile phone providers have come together and are looking at ways that that can be addressed. Um, but technology has been the great uh, um, uh, uh, success for us in terms of the profession, our members' ability to embrace uh, legal technology. Um, and we only see that um, uh, 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 continuing to um, uh, to be to progress. Um, and there have been challenges in as much at before uh, 2020, the pandemic, uh, uptake of uh, uh, law tech was slow, uh, legal technology was slow, um, uh, security remains an issue, uh, cyber security remains an issue um, when we're working uh, remotely, um, uh, uh, storing uh, data in the clouds and so forth. And of course, the cost. Um, smaller firms uh, uh, don't perhaps have the budget uh, uh, to invest in uh, legal technology. Um, but so those are uh, 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 some of the issues that we have seen that have come up uh, uh, in respect of, but it's got to be legal technology that really has changed uh, the way that our members uh, have worked and are working. All right, thank you, Stephanie. I, I warm to the point you make about having to upskill quickly on technology, being of a certain age myself, I had to uh, go on a steep learning curve. Uh, I've got to say, I'm still not a fan. It's a, it's a necessity to get us through. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, we are where we are. So um, I'm going to move on to another question now. Um, I'm going to put this one first of all to Colleen. So Colleen, what about people in different regions and situations having access to the law, which wasn't always easy in previous uh, normal times, let alone in a pandemic? So what, how would you say this is being dealt with? Yeah, that's um, an interesting question and, and actually follows on um, so well to what Stephanie's been talking about with this sort of technical divide. I mean, I think in reality, the access to um, legislation and and how it should be applied has always been a challenge in, you know, less developed countries where you might not have the same ability to to find out where the law is, like we've got a Gov UK site, there's not always that as an opportunity. And of course, I think thrown in the mix of the lack of access, but particularly to legislation per se, has been the lack of access to changing legislation, a point that was you know, made by Matthew earlier, you know, the guidance that keeps changing. Well, we've seen that the law kept, kept changing. And I, I think though what has happened, which is positive, is that um, like data providers trying to find solutions, I think that there are a number of tech firms um, and tech firms who operate in the legal space who have um, been trying to at least provide access, greater access to law and to legislation. As Stephanie said, you know, trials now by um, and trials by a, 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 a remote trials, that kind of thing. Um, and and actually, it's something that we did. Audia partnered with an organization called Libro, who um, provide an online legislation service. And we provided free access to COVID-19 legislation to anybody who signed up to it for a year as, as a mechanism just to, to try and break that divide in, in, in access to things. So, um, so I think, you know, hopefully we'll see more of that, you know, as 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 the the challenge continues with COVID, that actually the good thing that might come out of it is breaking down these sort of technical divides and allowing more access to things. Super. Thank you, Colleen. That's a great answer for that one. Matthew, I'm going to turn my attention to you now, if I may. <laughs> I have a question for you. How would you describe current levels of stress in the legal profession? Um, 
Well, <laughs> I think the legal profession has always been uh, renowned for having elements of stress within it anyway. Um, you know, I, I think from a, from a personal point of view, um, firstly, um, I think my stress as a lawyer has been, has come about through that anxiousness of trying to ensure that clients are getting the best service whilst at the same time trying to balance that home uh, life uh, balance, trying to get that balance there. And, um, you know, working at home, everyone on this call is now in my house with me. Um, and it's trying to be aware of that and, and having that divide between uh, my work life and my home life. Um, but I think in terms of the profession itself, um, the fantastic thing um, about technology is it's allowed us to keep in contact, it's allowed us to do business. But I think as a profession, we've um, struggled to adapt um, very quickly historically. And although we have now all um, changed and we're very virtual now, and I have to say, um, at my firm, DAC Beechcroft, we've we've done incredible work with our technology in terms of the equipment we've provided our employees, um, the uh, service that we can maintain with our clients through the accessibility of that technology. I think um, you'd be hard pressed to speak to many lawyers that have not would be on hand on heart say that dealing with that technology has not been stressful in its own right and getting to grips with teams meetings with zoom meetings with these these webinars trying to ensure a stable internet connection something that you, you're in the hands of your local provider with um, especially if you're homeschooling trying to make sure that you know if you're having important meetings with clients um, you know, the five-year-olds are not coming in demanding apples and things like that. And, and that adds to that stress in terms of um, the technology. And I think the other thing within the legal profession, and I actually, I think it's across a lot of the workplace now, is that a lot of people, especially in the UK, our work is often our life as well. And a lot of my friends are in the workplace. And I've not seen some of these people for nearly a year now. Um, and I think that's a really interesting point because the people that I worked with are also my friends and I go on my social life with them um, and so that has kind of come to a bit of a crashing halt and and frankly there's only so many zoom drinks you can do you know <laughs> everyone's feeling a little bit webinared out to be honest the irony of this of course is that we're having to do it virtually um, and on top of that I think there is this just human nature element where people are wanting to try and get back to normal and people are saying, I just want it to go back to normal. I'm fed up of this now. And certainly as a law firm, we've had to really support our people um, to make sure that they are getting the help that they need. A lot of people are in very challenging circumstances their home lives might be complicated regardless of whether they're lawyers or not. And I think this, this carrot dangling of this vaccine is also to a large extent not helping at the moment because I think a lot of people are feeling that the end's in sight but they're not quite there yet and I think that feeling of uncertainty and that lack of control whilst at the same time trying to adjust and work within the confines from home with technology and all of that so I think that is just piling on quite a lot of stress on everyone regardless of what job you do and where you are in the world and I think it's just that complete sea change in how the world is operating that is actually one of the issues here and I think that organisations like ours we're very fortunate we've we've got um, a welfare um, group of people that are, are really engaging with our workforce and trying to provide certainty to people where we can about their, their life, their employment, the stability of the firm, the stability of the sector, because there's nothing worse than feeling like you're out of control of your own life and your own job. And uh, certainly at DAC, I mean, we've just done a, a virtual town hall across our global offices, which was absolutely incredible. Uh, if you think about it, we had something like 1,200 people dial in and listen to our managing partner and our senior partner reassure the workforce and that was a big big thing internally and it had a the effect of I guess of steadying the ship and I, I'd be very interested to know what other law firms are doing to to support their people because I think sometimes 
within the law there is can there can be a focus on chargeable hours there can be a focus on on getting that billing and getting that work out to clients and those internal stresses that lawyers have but actually I think one of the things that I'm seeing from our firm and I'm hoping that other firms are doing as well is really supporting their people through this and trying to put in place measures to 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 back those people and support their workforce. Holy, thank you very much. I'm going to give uh, Stephanie and, and Colleen the opportunity to perhaps have a comment on this one if you'd like to. Uh, Stephanie, perhaps you first. Thank you very much, Neil. I mean, absolutely everything that Matthew has said, and there is no doubt that the pandemic has led to an increase in stress amongst solicitors. Um, and of course, it's important that we develop uh, resilience, um, you know, in order to help us deal with the added stress. Um, and uh, there are support networks. So what I wanted to say is there are support networks available for solicitors who feel perhaps that they are struggling at present, um, including the Law Society's own uh, pastoral helpline, but as well as law care. And what I wanted to mention about law care is law care has seen uh, an increase in um, calls coming through to its helpline. Um, and the one uh, uh, statistic, many statistics, but the one statistic that really sticks out for me is you know a report of 70% of females calling the helpline reporting uh, uh, added stress and, and, and impact on their mental health. Um, but I think it's important for individuals um, to get out. Um, I myself, it's it been almost a year since I've been working from home. I live on my own. Um, you sit here uh, uh, and you think, please don't let the door knock or you know um, a delivery come because then you have to juggle that. And, and that sounds something small, but you know, if it's on a continuous basis, um, that presents an issue. The fact that you know, um, I haven't seen family and friends, and as Matthew said, you know, we spend so much time at work. They are our social life and so forth. Um, but it's important that if you are struggling, that you um, speak up, say so. There is help out there. Um, and important, for instance, to, to get out there, like this morning, I didn't want to go out because it's very cold out there, um, but get out and, and, and you know, be in, the, in nature and, and be able to just release some of that anxiety where possible. But as I say, there are helplines uh, uh, um, that one can call if perhaps things are becoming too much. Lovely, Stephanie, thank you. Colleen, would you like to add anything? No, not really. I think that, um, you know, the stress levels that um, you're talking about for law is obviously the same kind of issues that are across business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all businesses having to manage their workforces and manage how they actually deal with this. And I like what Stephanie suggested, you know, it's practical. It's how do you get out? How do you find people that you can um, see and speak to? How, who can you join for a walk? And, you know, and, and actually get to do that. And, um, and, and like her, I would encourage everyone to, to, to take those small steps because they, they really do make a, a big change in your mental mindset. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much indeed for those on the subject of stress and this technology thing. I notice that some people are saying they're having sound problems. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's no real answer to this, is there? We, we've got to get back together as soon as we safely can, surely. That's my view anyway. Um, I've got another question for Stephanie and then I'm mindful of time. So after that, we'll have one or two open questions to, to the whole panel. But one more for you, Stephanie. So. To what extent are delays in court cases a problem and how is this being managed? Well, absolutely. So we know that um, in, the, in the Magistrates Court and the Crown Court that there are significant delays um, and a backlog in the tribunal uh, courts as well, uh, employment and so forth. Um, but so that we're clear, it, these uh, uh, delays, the backlog, haven't just been because of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's been exacerbated because of COVID, but the backlogs have always existed. Um, and this has been uh, for a number of factors, you know, uh, uh, including underinvestment uh, uh, in the justice system, closure of uh, 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 courts uh, around the country, as well as uh, a lack of funding, public uh, uh, or funding uh, to public uh, funding and legal aid. Um, and all of those together has got us into the backlog that we now see. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, instances of cases being listed into 2022, 23, uh, 2023, and the impact that that can have on individuals 
if you are perhaps a defendant in a criminal case and your liberty is at risk, um, or on witnesses' ability to recall events, or indeed the victim who is then, uh, um, you know, having to, to, to go through this delay. And of course, we've seen a number of newspapers this week talk about a number of cases being withdrawn, dropped, because of witnesses reluctant to come forward and speak out. So there is absolutely, um, and couple all of that, of course, with um, uh, uh, individuals feeling anxious uh, and concerned uh, for their safety of, of having to travel uh, to and from calls, um, you know, uh, 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 because of the pandemic, but also because of uh, transport um, or depending on what time of day uh, uh, the hearing is scheduled for. Um, but we are continuing uh, uh, to lobby government to ask for increased uh, spend in the justice system. And of course, government has recently uh, announced um, that they will be making or uh, have made a contribution to the justice system. However, uh, uh, more funding has to be put into the justice system to ensure that it is accessible, uh, equitable and affordable for those who need to, uh, uh, who are caught up in the justice system and need to exercise their rights. Lovely. Thank you, Stephanie. I have one or two other short questions now I'm going to put to all of you. I'm mindful of time, so we'll have some quick fire answers on perhaps on those. Um, so a question for you all. Do you think there has been or will be a rise in cases related to health and safety breaches at work as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Let's come to Matthew first. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that um, there probably will be a rise in in health and safety breaches and um, the RIDOR uh, regulations around reporting of COVID were um, a little unclear for some time and there was a lot of subjective testing required in terms of dealing with outbreaks and so there was a lot of decisions having to be made by health and safety managers across all sectors as to whether things were reportable or not and um, you know, we're certainly dealing with a few investigations that are ongoing by the regulators at the moment um, across the board following um, COVID related issues. Um, I don't think COVID's going to be going anytime soon. Um, we still manage asbestos, we still manage you know, other um, diseases and um, health related issues from times gone by and I think COVID will be the same and I think that um, yes we will begin to see some of these cases filter through from investigations through to court um, hearings in due course. Um, so you know getting advice and getting it sorted properly at the beginning is absolutely crucial thank you colleen anything to add to that no not really i i am um, i think it it's going to be interesting to see whether um a, a broader duty of care um will be enacted in or around um sort of civil claims perhaps more broadly for failure to to you know um, look after more vulnerable people in supply chains. Um, but I haven't seen anything come through directly at the moment. If anybody else has, please share it in, in the chat. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. All I was going to say is I did note that somebody in the chat mentioned a case that had recently taken place in Ireland um, on this particular topic. So, um, uh, and I think the individual may have shared the link um, to that case. Um, but but absolutely, I endorse uh, uh, you know everything that's been said. I think it's it's in, inevitable that we are going to see um, cases coming out of this. Okay, thank you. I think we've got time for possibly one, maybe two more, um, and then I will make a comment about the ones in Q and A. So, has whistleblowing been an effective means of addressing issues arising from COVID nineteen? Where shall we go first? Shall we go to Colleen first? Yeah, happy to take that out. So, so I'm interested in whistleblowing from particularly from a speak up um, point of view and from grievances for um, for individuals who are caught in forced labor or modern slavery um, issues. And I think from experience, they haven't been necessarily very um, effective. Um, we are seeing that a lot of businesses are having to rethink how they um, draft their whistleblowing policies, how they make speak up lines and hotlines accessible. And more importantly, how do they actually, um, uh, the people who are receiving the calls, do they actually 
understand how to identify what the real and particular issues are. So, so my own feeling is that, you know, that's an area that um, really should be addressed and um, strengthened for a lot of businesses and taking into account this extra layer of potential exploitation, which COVID has certainly highlighted. So thank you for that. Matthew, anything to add to that? On whistleblowing. Um, not really. I mean, I think um, certainly the uh, hope was that um, uh, for certainly from the HSE that people would call the HSE call centre to report any unsafe work. And we saw the posters that were required to be put up in the workplaces where the whistle HSE whistleblowing telephone number was. But I think actually, although I'm sure there were a lot of calls to it and there's been unannounced inspections and announced inspections by HSE, either in person or um, virtually or over the phone, uh, asking employers to, to show what policies and procedures they've got in place. I think in reality, um, it, it comes back to that point I was making earlier about the employer trying to make sure that their employees feel safe. And I think that's an important part in, in avoiding people feeling unsafe and feeling that they need to say something. Oh, thank you. Stephanie, anything else? On I, I think we're, calling we've been, we've been well covered thank you very much for that okay i think we can squeeze one more in so here we go so finally do you see a question to all of you do you see positive signs of employers taking their duties of care more seriously and workers understanding their rights and options what can we all do better and uh, wish we go for stephanie please I think, I mean, you know, this has been learning as we've been going along um, and, and, you know, the way we work, uh, uh, the policies that have been implemented have been continuously, or they should have been continuously developed, uh, deployed and so forth. Um, this is, COVID provides an, uh, uh, an opportunity to rebuild uh, stronger and better. Um, there are so many lessons to learn from this. Um, things are different, um, perhaps will be different. Um, and we have to take the lessons learned and the opportunities that it presents um, and move forward with that um, and how it will shape our future way of working, interaction. Some of us, of course, will want to remain at home, you know, if we believe the mm -hmm. statistics that are out there, the majority of us will want to uh, work at least two, three days from home. Um, employers will have to adjust to uh, uh, those requests and deal with those requests uh, uh, um, as they arise um, and, and how they will accommodate those requests. But also there is a great proportion of us who are uh, uh, who are eager to get back, you know, to the office. Uh, I, for one, am, uh, am one of those individuals who am looking very forward to getting back out and about, meeting members of the profession, um, shaking hands again, hugging, kissing, whatever the like be, but just getting back out and about um, and enjoying uh, uh, life again. Super, thank you. Matthew, can I give you uh, 30 seconds to perhaps just come through with a, uh, a concluding remark from yourself? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, th I think that um, employers have, uh, in most cases, I think, really stepped up. That's been my personal experience. I can only speak from my employer has supported our workforce, has listened, has undertaken workplace surveys, questionnaires, set up focus groups to try and make sure that there is better practice going forward thinking about what the new normal looks like when we do go uh, back to the office and, and what our requirements are and what our people want. And from speaking with my clients, um, I think they're pretty much doing the same thing. And I think that a lot of organisations are very aware of the people aspect, the welfare of people, the mental health aspect, and are doing all they can to try and ensure a smooth transition out of lockdown um, and taking the lessons they've learned throughout lockdown and implementing those lessons going forward. Super, thank you for that. And Colleen, a final word from you, if I may. Yeah, just uh, echoing what Matthew and Stephanie have said. I mean, I think, you know, to look at all of this, what is the opportunity? What um, what can you learn? What have you done? What can you do better? And I think certainly, as I said in one of my other comments, those businesses that really want to do the right thing are stepping up. They are looking at how they can be resilient, how they can support the people that work for them, that they can introduce a decent work agenda. And I love that. I think um, I'm hoping that we're going to see more of that 
that where there's a flip towards this decent fair work inclusion diversity um and yeah and just um ensuring that they protect the people that are helping them make their profits thank you very much indeed all of you so i know there are a lot of questions in the q a unfortunately we cannot get to them but we have said as i said at the beginning we're going to try and deal with those offline for you so thank you very much indeed to our panel today i hope you all agree it's been an insightful session and given somebody some some all of our, our listeners today some really great advice about law around the lockdown so thank you for that let me again remind you that iosh has its own covid19 resources page with advice and guidance that we're constantly updating to reflect the situation as it develops. This and links to the recording of this webinar will also be included in the post webinar email. Finally, just before we finish, I'd like to mention our Future Leaders Conference, which will take place on the 16th, the 18th of March this year. This virtual conference will use event technology that allows delegates to experience video networking opportunities, interactive workshops, and the latest insights on career progression, human factors, culture change, and more. And bookings have opened for this conference and the link to the registration page has, has just been added to the chat box. So if any of you are new to IOSH and the industry, this conference will certainly be worthwhile attending. Once again, thank you very much indeed to our panelists for being here today, for your involvement to uh, you all and to our listeners for participating. Please do stay safe, look after yourselves, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.